Our text this morning is found in Galatians chapter 5. I trust that you will turn there. And we will refer to it, so keep it open. I actually remembered to bring my reading glasses in this service so I can actually read part of it when it comes up. Father, as we reflect upon freedom, I ask that you would help us to understand your perspective and that we would be challenged today to live in our freedom in Christ. Amen. Abraham Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address 150 years ago. And it began with these now famous words. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty. Now we often go on with hardly a thought to the second part of that sentence and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. But a good portion of the Gettysburg Address is narrowed down to these words, conceived in liberty. And although Lincoln would go on to speak quite eloquently of the proposition that all men are created equal, and he'd speak of the war being fought to preserve any nation so conceived, the brave souls who gave their lives that such a nation would survive and they dedicated a a portion of land in their memory. And he challenged those listening and generations of school children since to be dedicated to the great task remaining. And the great task that he said was remaining was not about all men being created equal, but that this nation or any nation so conceived would give a new birth to freedom. Freedom was a big part of his understanding of why we started our nation and why it was worth fighting a great civil war to preserve it. And in the 150 years since he spoke those words, that's what our nation has done. We have been dedicated to the ideal of freedom. So we have fought World War I and World War II, Korea, Vietnam. We've gone into Grenada, Lebanon, Libya, the Persian Gulf, Afghanistan, Iraq, and numerous other little skirmishes on the world scene. We have held this incredibly wonderful ideal of freedom, not merely for people who are residents of the United States, but we want to give freedom to the world. And we've also fought the battle for freedom here on our land in the courts. And so the courts have, we have pressed in the courts freedom to do all sorts of things. And this week, the Supreme Court managed to bring down some rulings about freedom whether it has to do with the freedom of a state to set its own rules for votes, or whether it has to do with the Defense of Marriage Act. Our nation has fought for freedom, and we have won. We have freedom. But in gaining our freedom, we have bound ourselves to slavery, we have found that the freedom which was so hard won has produced a nation which is trapped. We have mistaken liberty for license. 
And if we have mistaken freedom to do that which is good for freedom to throw off all moral restraints. So we are no longer a nation pursuing freedom under God, as Lincoln said, but rather we are now a nation which pursues freedom from God. We have cast God out of the public life. And therein lies the challenge for people who love God. Therein lies the challenge for those of us who call ourselves Christians as we live in a post-Christian nation, in a post-Christian age, where it is no longer popular and acceptable to believe in God, to believe that there is a supreme being who has set moral standards for society and for individuals. The great mandate of our age continues to be freedom and liberty. It continues to push towards more and more tolerance. We no longer seek freedom under God. We just want to be free from God, to do what we want. As Christians... We know there's something wrong. We recognize that our nation has this, this quasi-Christian beginning. And we recognize that much of what we have stood for flows out of Scripture. So the nation can say we fully embrace Galatians 5 verse 1. It is there that Paul says... It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. That, those words would ring true to anyone who values freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And we even go on to, Romans, to Galatians 5.13, where Paul says, You, my brothers, were called to be free. Our nation can quote Scripture and fully embrace it. Now, I warn you that I actually didn't read the whole verse of either Galatians 5.1 or Galatians 5.13. And when you take verses out of context, you tend to be um, in trouble. For instance, the Bible says there is no God. Oh, the rest of that verse is the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Galatians says we have freedom, and our nation has grasped that. And this great call to freedom has led our nation to an atmosphere similar to that found in the book of Judges. Everyone does what is right in his own eyes, and you can't say anything about it. Because if we have genuine freedom, then that means that we must tolerate other people's choices because they're free to make those choices. Anything I do, I can do because I'm free to do it. And you can't tell me I can't. That's the end result of freedom. But the freedom we have defended with our lives and with our court system has not set us free. Instead, it has enslaved us, and it has pushed us away from God. It has trapped us in an endless spiral of degradation and decay. This, of course, isn't news to you. You don't have to read the news to realize that it really seems that much of our world is going someplace in a handbasket. And it might not be a good place. You can go to the local grocery store and see openly on magazines that which passed for pornography barely a generation ago. And your kids face it every day. You've observed this sinking of society. You've prayed about it. You've fretted about it. You've signed petitions 
You have voted your conscience. And you've lost. In this attempt to slow the death of our society and our nation, we have sought to do the right thing. We have stood against abortion. We have stood against same-sex marriage. We have stood against pornography. We have stood against legalized gambling. That's why we bought our lottery tickets. We have stood against legalizing drug use while we become uh, dependent upon prescription drugs. We've stood against just about everything. We have boycotted stores because they sold the wrong things. We have boycotted stores because they invested in the wrong things. And the net result of the church standing against stuff has occasionally been that a store changes its behavior. But mostly, we just get called intolerant. As though that moniker is the worst of insults a man can endure. In a society which says everyone is free to do what they want to do, being intolerant is a pretty nasty insult. A nation that is free and is on the cusp of celebrating that freedom. It is actually only four days away. Wednesday night, we will have fireworks in Fruta. And Thursday in Grand Junction. A great celebration. A much greater civic celebration than happens when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And as we come up against this celebration of freedom, this freedom which is so lauded and which has resulted in such a decaying society, I wonder what we should do. This is the question I was asking myself as I considered, what will I say on the Sunday before Independence Day? It is Thursday, and by the way, just as a... As a Side note, the, the highest day for hot dog consumption in the United States is the 4th of July. And it turns out that the hot dog manufacturers are in trouble because we as citizens of the United States are eating less and less hot dogs. And so do one industry a favor and eat a hot dog or buy a hot dog and feed it to your cat. Help the hot dog sales. Celebrate freedom. <laughs> or maybe don't eat hot dogs and <laughs> really celebrate freedom. Fourth of July, what are we going to do? Our great nation can hardly be called Christian anymore. So do we celebrate it? Do we dance in the streets? We're free, we're free. I think you could make an argument that we ought to have nothing to do with this declaration of independence as Christians. It's only led to trouble. But <clears throat> I say we embrace it this week. We embrace freedom, not as the world would embrace freedom, but freedom as it's meant to be. The freedom spoken of in Galatians chapter 5. Freedom which is granted by our Creator. Because you, my brothers, were called to be free. And the rest of that verse. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. So the 4th of July is coming. And I suggest that we set out to change the mindset of a tolerant world in regard to Christians. That we would be known not for what we stand against, but for what we stand for. That we would use our freedom first to serve one another.
to serve. That's what the text says when it comes to verse 13. You were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge a sinful nature. Rather, serve one another. On the 4th of July, many of you will have the day off. You'll be able to do whatever you feel like doing. Have a hot dog eating contest if you want. Or eat tacos. Apparently tacos are outpacing hot dogs in the United States now. You're free to serve. The hallmark of the Christian ought to be not the things we stand against, but the things we stand for and the way we turn our love for Christ into an instrument for Christ, that we serve one another. There are lots of ways that we could serve. You could serve a meal at Homeward Bound. Matter of fact, someplace here in the, in the room, there's a sign-up list for people with, to say, I'll come and help prepare a meal and serve. You could serve at the soup kitchen. You could serve society by doing something unusual. Take yourself a broom and sweep, sweep someone's sidewalk. Maybe even someone you don't particularly love that you would choose to do something nice for a society which oftentimes isn't very nice. So the first thing we can do is to serve one another, but our text also suggests something else we can do with our freedom, and that is to love one another. Look at verse 14. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Paul suggests that in our freedom, we ought to give up our fighting. I do a fair amount of counseling. People come to me with their marital problems, with their problems with their employer or their employee. And I have, after 30 years of pastorate, come to one conclusion, and that is that there are two passages of Scripture which can dramatically change our lives if we will let them. Now, certainly there are others, but when I'm counseling, two come to mind consistently. The first is Philippians 4.8. That's a verse which simply admonishes us to think about the good stuff. Whatsoever is good, pure, upright, worthy of good, rep or good repute, Set your mind on these things. People come into my office all wrapped up and all upset with one another. One of the questions I often ask is, remind me why you got married. And they start talking about it. And I said, now, in what way do you love your wife? And sometimes they have difficulty with that. I say, why did you marry him? And they begin to talk, and I say, you know, here's the key to you having marital happiness. Think about the good stuff. That's what God does for you. Think about the good stuff. And then I go to another passage, and it's a well-used passage appropriately, 1 Corinthians 13. The love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not keep track of wrongs suffered. Love thinks the best. Love one another. Imagine how different our society would view the church if within the church our marriages were intact because we chose to serve one another and to love one another in a biblical manner. Imagine how it would impact society if instead of saying, I stand against, I stand against, I stand against, they saw that the place where the majority of marriages lasted 50 years was always in the church. If people celebrated 70-year anniversaries and 
every person that celebrated a 70th year anniversary said, the reason that I stayed married for 70 years is because of Jesus Christ. Because we stand for keeping our word. We will love one another. Is it easy? Well, no. I've looked at myself in a mirror. It's a marvel that Michelle would stay with me for 30 years. But she has chosen to live biblically. And so has your spouse. And so should you. See, we ought to stand for something positive instead of standing against the ills of society. So, use our freedom to serve one another, to love one another. And then I suggest we use our, our freedom to live in the Spirit. Verse 16, Paul says, So I say, live by the Spirit. And then, if you drop down to verse 24, or 25, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That we would be people who understand the dynamic and the incredible freedom of living by the Spirit of God. We see around us the evidences of a world which has embraced freedom from God rather than freedom under God. We see around us the acts of the sinful nature all around us, we see the things listed in Galatians chapter 5, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, and the like. And although this sounds like a description of what's happening in Congress, The first service didn't even get that. It's like I had to stop and say, I had to repeat that sentence. It sounds like a description of what's happening in Congress. It's really a description of what happens when freedom is embraced as the highest goal in and of itself without regard to God. We slip into what the Scripture calls sin. And I'm not suggesting that we embrace or approve or condone sin in any way but I am suggesting that there is a better approach to the people around us who don't live by kingdom standards. Do we recognize that what is spoken of in Galatians chapter 5 is the human condition and the end result of freedom without God, the end result of a nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to making sure that that nation survives? to have absolute freedom which allows everyone to do what is right in their own eyes and they will sue you for the opportunity to do it. And therefore, we'll have people, atheists, who will set up monuments to, to provide balance to the Ten Commandments. And that's fine on this world. And I don't have a problem with, that, do, with them doing that because we know that eventually the scales will tip strongly in our favor. We are called to be different. We are called to a greater freedom than that which the world embraces today. We are called to a freedom in Christ which allows us to stand for something instead of against every perceived sin. We have a freedom which not, is not about standing against stuff, but which lifts the human spirit in the same way that Christ lifted the human spirit of the sinners around him. He did so without ever approving of their sin, but always constantly offering the love of God. We ought to respond with a love which is done in the name of Christ. We ought to walk in step with the Spirit, daily exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit as a contrast to the deceptive and destructive freedom of the world finds so alluring. It is in this same chapter in Galatians, the, the same chapter where Paul says, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free, where he says you were called to be free. This same chapter, Paul admonishes us 
believers in Jesus Christ, to live by the fruit of the Spirit. So perhaps one of the best ways to celebrate our freedom this week is to celebrate fruit. Not fruits, but fruit. That we would celebrate freedom by standing in contrast to the world by living a life full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The world embraces a freedom which is the opposite of these things. The freedom of society says that we don't have to be kind. Just read some of the things that people are willing to put on, online the, or to tweet. The world says that we can say what we want no matter what the fallout is. The world says we don't have to promote peace. Patience is overdone. We want what we want when we want it, and we want it now. And most certainly the world does not involve self-control. But the greatest freedom mankind can experience is the freedom of the fruit of the Spirit. And that is what we have to offer, and it's what we ought to stand for. It's how we ought to approach the world around us with love and patience and kindness. I believe that the world has had enough of us standing against anything that even hints of a sin that we ourselves would not commit. They just see that as intolerance and they don't like it. And they will not respond to the message of Christ if all they see is that those who represent Christ are intolerant and therefore intolerable. So instead, let's reflect Christ to the world. Christ who loved as no one has loved before, for saints. Christ who experienced great joy and provided an incredible amount of really good wine for a wedding celebration. I grew up where we boycotted places that sold alcohol. A lot of good that did. Christ, who was kind to people. He was kind when he was interrupted, when he was harassed, when he was abandoned. Let us reflect Christ to the world. Christ, who could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world, but in self-control and love for us, died upon a cross. Christ, who was gentle with people who were caught in sin. Christ, who ate with sinners. Christ, who was sent into the world not to condemn it, but to save it and give it true freedom. So, the 4th of July, it's hot dog day. I'm glad it only comes once a year. But the message of freedom in Scripture is a message which I believe ought to drive us to embrace and celebrate the freedom we have in Christ by living out in our lives the fruit of the Spirit and none of the words included in that list that we call the fruit of the Spirit, none of them involve things like boycotting and shouting and picketing and signing petitions and being in the face of people who really just need Jesus. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would help us whenever we think of the freedom of our society and whenever we think of the, the, with the sadness of the way our society seems to be going downhill so fast, help us to embrace Jesus, to reflect Jesus to our world so that they might experience freedom in Christ. Amen.